So you can see both sides of the political spectrum ready to go to war for what they believe are their rights. Just want to repeat that it, all this plays into the hands of the Black Papacy. You know, he said that it's a promise. These are also promises. He that kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. So welcome to the final installment of this series. I hope today to just tie it all together and show how important I believe this teaching is for the times that are coming ahead of us, how we are to stand in the light of tyranny and oppression. Just to recap again, God has given the ministry of punishing evildoers into the authorities. They bear the mark of Cain. Not because they're good, but because God needed someone with a heavy hand to manage sinners. And there's truth in what Job said. The earth is given into the hand of the wicked. He had a lot of uh, mistaken thoughts, but there is truth in that. Now, the New World Order is not something that is coming to be feared or prevented. The New World Order actually began with the fall of Adam. And... This new order was administrated by Cain. When Adam fell, the dominion passed into the hands of his conqueror, the devil. And Cain is, in a way, the devil's main man on earth. That mark flowed through the powers of this world, beginning with Babylon, with Nimrod. Um, the Caesars of Rome held this power as Pontifex Maximus. And even in a sense, the papal rules of this world do bear this mark and them being, even taking the same title, Pontifex Maximus, as the successors of this rule, of this dynasty, and goes all the way back to Cain. Now the papacy hold in bondage the children of disobedience through their false teachings. And notice that the, falling, that the establishment of the papacy, if we reason from cause to effect, came through, through the falling away of the Christian church, as Paul says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 there, that day shall not come except they're coming a falling away of first. That's what led to the man of sin being revealed. It was the people's acceptance of her doctrines and falsehoods that led to the establishment of him as the ruler over them. They even brazenly admit the mark of Cain is stamped upon our foreheads as a statement of fact. And they certainly do resemble Cain, where they torture and persecute people. The world has chosen the papacy as their ruler. We see in the false science that comes from them with the heliocentric model. It's taught in scientific circles. Her false teachings are taught in all the churches and her political ideologies are cherished by all lands. So truly, as she says in her heart, I sit a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. She does rule over the world because they have chosen her beliefs as opposed to what God has revealed in his word. Babylon, they have divided themselves on three jurisdictions. The USA, the nation of, of America, to be the military arm of the control system that they have created over the world. I believe they chose that back in 1776. It's evidenced by all the iconography that the founding fathers placed in the buildings, etc. As you can see here, that eight-pointed star, the mark of Cain on the Supreme Court building there. And we see on the gable, the two Roman soldiers protecting the, the dictator who represents, I believe, the Black Pope, the military dictator, hence the fasciae there in one of the soldiers' hands, which is a symbol of totalitarianism. And you see it again beside the president, the fasciae symbol, representing the Roman fascism, which is today seen in the office of the Black Pope. This military arm of, of Rome has been very effective and served her powerfully throughout this, through, since her beginning. The game changer being the game changer in any, every war and implementing regime change all, all around the world as we've seen today. Notwithstanding the fact that the black papacy rules over the American government, rules over basically all the governments in the world, and if they don't, they, they get eliminated, which is why all these places are being affected by regime change. What William Tyndale wrote 500 years ago is true. If we resist evil rulers seeking to set ourselves at liberty, we shall no doubt bring ourselves into more evil bondage. A Christian man in respect of God is but a passive thing, suffereth only and doth not. 
I've really enjoyed reading this book. As I mentioned last week, I haven't seen anything stating that he supported King Henry VIII in his decision to make himself the head of the church. The Catholic divines, we saw, taught the opposite of this, as we saw with Thomas Aquinas. He says that if any society of people have the right of choosing a king for itself, it is not unjust if he be deposed by the same, when by a royal tyranny he abuses his power. The Catholic divines taught rebellion against these, these appointed rulers because the more rebellion there is in the world, the more power goes to the ruler who rules, from in, who rules incognito, which is the black pope. The more people rebel, the more power he gets. So that's why they're constantly encouraging rebellion. As we said, it goes back to that mark in Genesis 4.15. Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken upon him sevenfold. Are we called to warfare with the powers of darkness? Are we? Are we called? Of course we are. We're, we are. <laughs> Although we're not to, to rebel against the rulers of this world in a physical way, not to challenge their authority, which they have been passed down them from Cain. We're still at war with them, in a sense. Paul says, We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So we are at war with these powers. We are to war with them. But listen to the way we're to war. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, these are our weapons, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all things taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye may be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. So our weapons are, he's metaphorically using real weapons, comparing them with our weapons. This is how we have to fight with the, with the powers of darkness, not with the carnal weapons, as he says here. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. We are to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. We're not to get involved in the politics, get taken away by these popular movements and foolish ideologies that men make, that we may please him who has chosen us to be a soldier. This last part, uh, I think, is key to it all. And if a man strive, also strive for masteries, yet he is not crowned, except he strive lawfully. There's a lawful way we can fight with the powers of darkness and an unlawful way. That's why we read about the sevenfold vengeance being taken against those who challenge Cain's authority. We can strive against this, the rules of darkness. And there's the only lawful way is through these weapons that Paul was speaking about, the sword of the spirit, etc. The word of God. Not carnal weapons that they use. Now this principle of, of Christians not fighting with carnal weapons was understood by who I believe are the greatest example of apostolic Christianity outside of the, apostol of the apostolic church. The Anabaptists represented apostolic Christianity more than any other group, I, I believe. Even, even the pioneers. Because the reason I believe that is, is because they, they went through persecution, deadly persecution. It brought out that characteristic apostolic Christianity. And not all of them. Some of them have some pretty strange ideas. But uh, some of them were right on with, with the spirit of true apostolic Christianity. And apostolic Christianity most definitely was a nonviolent group. They didn't, you read all the acts and all of the, Church Fathers' accounts, not once do you read of any violent acts being committed by them. This is from the Schlietheim Confession, which was a profession of faith that was being given by the Anabaptists around Central Europe there, Switzerland and Austria. While this Schlietheim Confession was in session, they were actually apprehended by the authorities and all taken off. But let's have a read of what they said here. We have been united as follows concerning the sword. The sword is an ordering of God outside the perfection of Christ. They placed it outside. That's for the, those that you know, are ordained of God to, to use it. It punishes and kills the wicked and guards and protects the good. In the law, the sword is established over the wicked for punishment and for death. 
and the secular rules that are established to were the same, straight out Romans 13. But within the perfection of Christ, only the ban is used for the admonition and exclusion of the one who has sinned. Without the death of the flesh, simply the warning and command to sin no more. Now, the ban is removing someone out of the church, like Jesus talks about in Matthew 18. That is the way that discipline is meted out by Christians. Another part of this confession. Christ Jesus, who has freed us from the servitude of the flesh and fitted us for the service of God and the Spirit, whom he has given us, thereby shall also fall away from us the diabolical weapons of violence, such as sword, armor, and the like, and all of their use to protect friends against enemies. By virtue of the word of Christ, you shall not resist evil. That's what Jesus said in Matthew 5, that you resist not evil. He's also famous for the way he was martyred. He's, the bravery of this man is, is beyond worldly soldiers' bravery. The way he defended himself. If you get a chance to read his defense, it was skillful and courageous. They were apprehended during this meeting. They put nine charges upon them, the Austrian Catholic authorities. And let's just have a read of his defense. One thing they hated about them was their rejection of the use of the sword because they felt that if, if all were to do that, then the Turks were going to come and kill a lot of them. So they, they hated them very much for this. And Sattler had said that he had branded the Christians that used the sword against the, the saints as worse than the Turks. And they, this, and they brought a charge him against him for that. And he says, if the Turks should come, we ought not to resist them. This is in his trial and defense. For it is written, thou shalt not kill. We must not defend ourselves against the Turks and others of our persecutors, but I to beseech God with earnest prayer to repel and resist them. But that I said that if warring were right, because they mis misconstrued his words to make sound something else, he said, I would rather take the field against the so-called Christians who persecute, apprehend and kill pious Christians than against the Turks was for this reason. The Turk is a true Turk, knows nothing of the Christian faith and is a Turk after the flesh. Now, now remember, he's, he's standing the face of people that are about to execute him. And he says, but you who would be Christians and who make your boast of Christ, persecute the pious witnesses of Christ and are Turks after the spirit. Now that takes a lot of courage. It, it reminds me of Stephen when he was, just before he was being martyred. You notice during his speech, he got even stronger as he realized that, that they were about to kill him. And, and, you know, these people weren't wimps. Just because you don't want to use a sword doesn't make you a wimp as a lot of uh, people seem to want to talk about these days. I noticed when I watch YouTube videos. Now, this kind of apostolic faith and spirit, this uh, continued on, obviously, underground as a part of the church, the church in the wilderness, doesn't only apply to the wall densities. And it's from these people that we get all the teachings that we cherish, believers' baptism, separation of church and state, all these things, that, they didn't come from the main body of Protestants, they came from the Anabaptist. Now, I want to hone in on, on liberty of conscience. This is absolutely a, a heritage of them. And it was this that led the English separatists, known as, also known as the pilgrims, to leave England and set sail for the new world so they could live and practice their faith in peace without persecution. 150 years after these people went, these heirs of Anabaptism set sail for America. You had the, what's known as the birth of the USA, the War of Independence. Although the a result, positive result of it was they made a law about religious liberty, it was not fought for the purpose of securing religious liberty. That wasn't what instigated the war. The war was instigated because of what they defined as tyranny from the English um, king. <clears throat> the soldiers that had fought and won for religious liberty did not use carnal weapons. They, had, they were the, the pilgrim, pilgrim fathers and the, the Anabaptists and others that had come to America. I believe the Revolutionary War was orchestrated by Rome to get Protestants to fight each other, as I showed in the part two of Image, Image of the Beast. It was a divide and conquer exercise <clears throat> with agents on both sides. I've always wondered why these people with this heritage of Anabaptism and non-use of the sword, etc., love of separation of church and state, would engage in 
a warfare such as this, bloody and terrible war that it was. One of the ways they overcame these Christian beliefs that they obviously had was through this group known as the Black Robed Regiment. I heard about this. It was very interesting. These men, preachers, would mount the pulpit in black robes and they would take off their robes and underneath they had military uniforms and pull out guns and, and they'd start preaching about how you can use these weapons. And they, Anyway, I'm just going to read from a, a passage from a famous sermon by someone. I don't know if he was part of this black robe, but he was obviously of this mentality. And just listen to the way they try and diffuse this um, Christian principles. Notice the rationalization that he uses in this. He based it on Galatians 5.1, Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. Trying to suggest that this means we should fight with weapons. Notice what he says. It is not, however, to be denied that there are some passages in the New Testament which seem to forbid all war, particularly our Savior's own words in his Sermon on the Mount. I say unto you that ye, sh ye resist not evil, love your enemies, do good to them that hate you, etc. And those of the Apostle Paul recompense no man evil for evil, avenge not yourselves. So these seem to forbid one. And some others of like import. And from such passages, some have supposed that Christians are not allowed to defend themselves by force of arms, how violently so they may, may be attacked. When our Savior forbids us to resist not evil, he seems to have in view only small injuries, not large ones such as the tyranny we're facing here. Those are my words. But it does not follow that because we are forbidden to resist such slight attacks, we may not defend ourselves when the assault is of a capital kind. Notice the rationalization he's using here. Supposing our Lord's words refer only to small injuries, they ought not to be taken in an absolute sense. Expressions of this nature frequently occur in Scripture, which are universally understood with certain restrictions and limitations. What can we restrict? Love not the world, nor the things are in the world. That, that has restrictions. Lay not yourselves treasure on earth. Give to him that asketh thee, and for him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou not away. Now, I believe nobody ever supposed, not even the honest Quakers, that these precepts were to be understood so literally as to forbid all love of the world. And we have as our good right to limit the precept which forbids our resisting evil by the nature and reason of things as we have to limit these other indefinite expressions. You notice the way there, it's just, you know, it's only little things. You can, you can, you can take out, you can use weapons now against, against the, your, the tyrants. Notice the way they're neutralizing the gospel through this rationalization. Anyway, in spite of this, the war was not overwhelmingly supported. This is from the history website. It is impossible to know the exact number of American colonists who favored or opposed independence. The current thought is that about 20% of the colonists were loyalists, those who remained loyal to England. Another group, small group, in terms of percentage were the dedicated patriots, for whom there was no alternative but independence. Often overlooked are the fence sitters, they call them, who made up the largest group. So not everyone was involved in this. It was only a small number that were actually involved in it. In the long run, however, the Patriots were much more successful in attracting support. American Patriots won the war of propaganda, writing such as Thomas Paine's Common Sense stirred newfound American nationalism. John Adams, the second president, famously said, Without the pen of Paine, the sword of Washington would have been wielded in vain. So it was Thomas Paine's propaganda that got them willing to fight in this war. Not all of them, actually. It was only a small number. Notice what he says here. Notice the um, Bellarmineian theology here. But where, says some, is the king of America? I tell you, friend, he reigns above and doth not make havoc of mankind like the royal brute of Britain. In America, the law is king, for as absolute governments, the king is law. So in free countries, the law ought to be king, and there ought to be no other. Now, it sounds pretty reasonable, but lest any ill use should afterwards arise, let the crown at the conclusion of the ceremony be demolished and scattered among the people whose right it is. And that's this idea of popular sovereignty. A government of our own is our natural right. Ye that love mankind, ye that dare oppose, not only the tyranny, but the tyrant stand forth. As we studied last time, this is this Bellarmenian ideology. You know, the Bible does not permit the Christians to rise up against the authorities that God has ordained. The God has given, has made the king the, the ruler. 
He is ordained to be the ruler, not, not the people. Now, this, this um, Bellarmenian philosophy is actually all throughout the American Declaration of Independence. Obviously, they either read Bellarmine directly or some, through some way, because just watch the comparisons here. All men are created equal. That's Thomas Jefferson in the Declaration of Independence. Cotton Bellarmine, in a commonwealth, all men are born naturally free and equal. Are all men created equal? Yeah, they are. In God's sight, all souls are equal. The Bible says there is neither Jew, barbarian, Scythian, etc. In, in God's opinion, all souls are of equal value. Um, husband, wife, children, all, all in a family, all souls are of equal value. But does that mean that that authority rests with all of them? Does that mean that um, the children have, have a right to dictate to the parents? No. So just because all, so all men might be equal in God's sight doesn't, doesn't throw away the fact that God's authority, God has ordained authority to one and more than another. So what they mean by all men are created equal here is not, is not really, not so much in God's sight, but their authority should be equal, which is not a biblical concept. And the conclusion they draw from all men are created equal is governments are ensued among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. The Bible says that the authorities are ordained of God. That their authority comes from God, not the people. And you can read there in Bellamine on the right, the people themselves immediately and directly hold the political power so long as they have not transferred it to the this power to some king or all, it's, it's exactly the same thought being, being conveyed there. And if the people hold the power, then the people have the, have the right to overthrow the government, which is the next thought both of them would say. Wherever any form of government becomes destructive to those ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute a new government. Prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. And then the same thing says Bellamine, for legitimate reason, the people can change the government to an aristocracy or a democracy. You see the comparisons are, are they're, they're identical. You know, Catholic uh, writers and historians, I've noticed this. Were Mason and Jefferson conscious of their debt to Bellamine? Or did they use Filmer's presentation of his doctrine without knowing that they were doing so? Did the Americans realize they were staking their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor in support of a theory of government which had come down to them as announced by a Catholic priest? We cannot answer these questions. We remember that rebellion against ordinances of God increases the papacy's power. It increases their control. This is from a Catholic scholar and writer in political science, Alfred O'Reilly. The Declaration of Independence is an accurate transcript of the Catholic mind. He recognized his religion in that Declaration of Independence. Now, the Catholic mind is a mind of rebellion and a mind of sin. I'm not saying all Catholics have, have that mind, but that's what the religion teaches. The Pope is called the man of sin because he increases sin throughout the world. Wherever, wherever, he, wherever he, is, he is looked up to, he increases sin and lawlessness. And so this ideology encourages rebellion against ordinances of God. <clears throat> it militates against Christian principle, which we, which is, which we, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not, you know, resist not evil, which is exactly what the, the, this philosophy drove those, those who were the heirs of the pilgrim faith to do, to engage in bloody war. Notice what William Tyndale says, Oh, how saw differeth the doctrine of Christ and his apostles from the doctrine of the Pope and his apostles? For if any man will obey neither father nor mother, neither lord nor master, neither king nor prince, the same needeth but only to shave himself a monk, a friar or a priest, and is then immediately free and exempted from all service and obedience unto, due unto man. He that will obey no man as they will not is most acceptable unto them. The more disobedient that thou art unto God's ordinances, the more apt and meet art thou for theirs. Neither is the professing, vowing, and swearing obedience unto their ordinances any other thing than defying, denying, and forswearing obedience unto the ordinances of God. That's the Catholic mind. That's the Catholic system, is rebellion to God, rebellion to man, rebellion to all the ordinances. Notice the first seal that was made by Benjamin Franklin 
1776. It was actually rejected in favor of the small one on the right there. Rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God. Now, is this a Christian sentiment? It may appear so on the outside, but this is a very Roman Catholic sentiment. Because as we saw, we just seen in a previous statement, the Catholic Church taught rebellion to the ordinances that God has enjoined us to do. This is from greatseal.com. Jefferson's suggestion for the Great Seal was the children of Israel in the wilderness led by a cloud by day and a pillar by night. Jefferson likened the motto, rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God so much. He used it on his personal seal. Also, it seems to have inspired the upper motto Charles Thompson suggested for the final design of the reverse side of the Great Seal. Anuit Coeptus, the, great, the other one, the green one there. God has favored our undertakings, but that God is Jupiter. It's talking about another name for Jupiter is Lucetius, Lucifer. So Lucifer has favored our undertakings. So depending on who your God is, rebelling to tyrants is obedience to God may be accurate. We know that Benjamin Franklin was a high-level Freemason. The Bible does not paint rebellion in a good light anywhere that I know, that I know, that I know of. It's always a negative. Notice in 1 Samuel 15, for rebellion is the sin, is the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is iniquity and idolatry. The as is supplied there. Rebellion is not a, a thing a Christian should profess or even should harbor in his heart. Rebellion is a satanic attribute. The children of Israel's departure from Egypt was not rebellion. They repeatedly asked to be let go and God finally delivered them. It's not, not a correct way to portray it. In any case, rebellion to tyrants doesn't pay. It doesn't benefit you. The, it's just a ploy that has been used to make people more controllable, in a sense, to bring, you, bring people into control of the, the, black, the black papacy. And what William Tyndale says is true. If we resist evil rulers seeking to set ourselves at liberty, we shall no doubt bring ourselves into more evil bondage and wrap ourselves in much more misery and wretchedness. So any resistance, even if the rulers are evil, it brings us into more bondage. This is actually, this is true. It, and historically, in the history of America, we can see when they actually tried to, when, when the constitution may have been on people's side, and they, but they went forth with rebellion, in rebellion, against someone they believed to be an oppressor, it actually made them worse off. That was, we, that was shown in the War of Southern Secession, also known as the, the Civil War. The South just wanted to secede from the Union. The South wanted the Union to get out of their states and leave them alone, but the North, the North wouldn't allow that, and hence the war. They rebelled against the authority of the Union and they paid dearly for it According to the Constitution, the South actually had a good case. The North actually refused to go to, to, to go to court with them afterwards. The leader of the South, Jefferson Davis, asked to be put on trial, but they wouldn't because they, they would have lost the case. They refused to go to the case because he had a really good case according to the Constitution. They were morally um, in the wrong because they obviously were pro-slavery. But as far as the Constitution was concerned, they had a good case, but Vengeance was taken upon them sevenfold because they rebelled against the authority of the Union. I think that might have been the reason why they pictured Abraham Lincoln in that statue with the symbols of fascism under, under his hands there. Because he did. He acted quite tyrannically towards them. You know, but that was, that was what he had to do. He had to put down rebellion. That's his appointed office. Another time when people were punished for just following what the Constitution says was the Waco siege. This siege at Waco was the sacrificial murder of almost 100 men, women and children by the US federal government. The official story is full of lies. If um, anyone's interested in hearing about it, I recommend watching the Rules of Engagement documentary detailing the, the history of Waco. It will be very disturbing, but um, it's very interesting. So basically what happened was the ATF turned up at the, the compound there and opened fire on the house and tortured them with psychological warfare of a 51 day siege and then pumped gas into the building and burned them all alive. It was a terrible thing. But 
did the brutal murder of all those all those people did it serve God's cause? What do they? What do people think of Waco? People, most people think of it as it's it's known as an infamous cult. It's not true that they they set their own building on fire, but it hasn't served to bolster the image of God's people, like the martyrdom of of many of many has. And it cannot really be said that God was with them and protected them. I would like to maybe understand why that was. We read in total. The Texas Department of Public Safety, led by the Texas Rangers, recovered more than 300 firearms from the Branch Davidian compound. In addition, a number of live grenades, more than 300 grenade components, were uncovered. Hundreds of thousands of rounds of ammunition were also seized. They were stockpiling military weapons. They were they were selling them and making a lot of money out of their trade, with of the at gun shows, etc. They had a shooting range and people often reported hearing machine gun fire. Now, there's nothing illegal about any of this according to the U.S. Constitution. The Constitution says a well-regulated militia in the Second Amendment, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. This, is, they, it was, this was their constitutional right. But the rulers of evil, they don't follow the Constitution. They follow their own rules of engagement. And according to them, what they did was mm. standard procedure. Now, the U.S. government bears that mark of Cain that flows through from the, the black papacy. We saw in the, in the iconography before. From an, an inquisitional standpoint, they had crossed the line and retribution was going to be taken. They professed Bible knowledge while brandishing deadly weapons against what Christ commanded. Sevenfold vengeance would have been taken was taken there. Now notice the this is an I'm going to read from an affidavit, which is the which led to the warrant which allowed the federal agents to go and search the compound. They didn't actually search anything, they just turned up and started shooting them. Notice how they dutifully detail the scriptural errors of David Koresh in this document that led to the warrant. What is the government dutifully detailing scriptural errors for? If you understand it as an inquisition, you can see why. Vernon Howell changed his name because he believed that the name helped designate him as the Messiah or the anointed one of God. What has that got to do with arresting someone? One group member stated that Koresh's teachings did not always coincide with the Bible. David Koresh stated that the Bible gave him right to bear arms. Well, if that's his belief. Koresh stated that the imminent end of the world would be a military type operation and that all non-believers would have to suffer. Now, I understand I've been told Davidians have some interesting interpretations of prophecies like um, Ezekiel 9. So, but, but these are the things that led them to storm the compound. It was in response to this that Cain and the Black Papacy carried out what is the standard inquisitional procedure. They set an example of them, and it has set a precedent for any others that will do the same. So according to the people that behind the, the government, they're, they're not bound by the Constitution. It was actually the Davidians following the constitution that provoked the vengeance that was taken upon them i'm not saying what what the government was, did was good you know they're going to be they're going to be um they're going to answer to god for those for those killings of all those children but that's how they operate sevenfold vengeance now i'm going to read some bible passages here that i believe are pretty authoritative on this topic Matthew 25, And behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword, this is when Jesus was being arrested, and struck a servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. And then Jesus said unto him, Put again, up again thy sword into his place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Obviously that excludes those who, who have been commanded to bear it. But... That's what he says. You, all that live by the sword will die by the sword. That's a that's a that's a promise of Jesus that many have sadly recognised. 
He might have been quoting from Genesis 9. Whosoever sheddeth man's blood by man, shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made him man. This is, this is God speaking to Noah here. And God said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. When God says, Vengeance is mine, that means that if you take it as your prerogative to take vengeance, you're in fact robbing God of his, of his, of his prerogative. It is his prerogative. It's not just, he's not just saying that because he wants to look after you. He's saying, he's saying you're, you're, you're robbing me of, of my duty and my will for you. You're actually also robbing yourself of his protection when you, when you go out to, or even, even prepare, I think. Like the, the Davidians, they didn't actually attack anyone. They didn't use them, but they obviously, was, as David Koresh said, it was going to be a military type operation. They were, had, the, had the idea that they would be using these weapons. And I think this, is beca this, this becomes very important as we go through the events that are starting to take place around us. Notice another verse, Revelation 13. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and faith of the saints. So the, the patience and faith of the saints is to understand these things, that we're not to lead into captivity, but not to kill with the sword. Because, as is repeated in Scripture, he that kills with the sword will be killed with the sword. But also notice the context in which this is said in Revelation 13. This is the, the mark of the beast chapter. Verse 7, And it was given unto him, the papacy, to make more war with the saints, and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and nations and tongues. Now, we correctly apply this as a historical application, but there is obviously... A future application of this because it says over all kindreds and tongues and nations this hasn't happened yet and all that the earth shall worship him that hasn't happened yet either so in the time when papacy is making war on all nations and in the period leading up to it there's obviously going to be a lot of killing with the sword going on that's why, why else would would it say that in verse 10 there there's going to be a lot of violence and we're starting to see that now we really are starting to see that Another thing I'm, I'm starting to, to, to believe is that it is this people killing each other with the sword that is actually going to bring on the, the mark of the beast and the, the religious laws that are going to come. It's going to become in response of the people's violence towards each other. You know, when we resist evil rulers, we bring ourselves into more bondage and that's what's happening. Another thing. In Luke 17, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. How was it in the days of Noah? In Genesis 6, and the earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with, with the earth. The days of Noah were the days of violence. People were killing each other, just like what's happening now. This picture on the left was an incident that happened in Portland, I believe. This young man kicked in the head. and A lot of these events are maybe scripted and staged, but nonetheless, a lot of them are real also. Um, we're seeing America just turn into a war zone. And I believe it's, this, it's the violation of, of this principle of um, res of resisting the ordained authorities of God that's going to bring the, the worst kind of tyranny upon the world. Genesis says, sevenfold vengeance on him that slayeth Cain. That's what's going to happen. It's going to be the people. It's going to, if you reason from cause to effect, it's going to be the people's revolt that's going to bring the religious tyranny upon them. Because wicked rulers increase with the wickedness of the people. These people with their violent uprisings and rioting, they're being manipulated being manipulated by the, the Jesuits and their agents. I want to read a letter of, of the Albert Pike letter to the Mazzini. Mazzini. Mazzini was the, Albert Pike was obviously the, the illustrious 33rd degree Freemason. Um, and Mazzini was the head of the mafia. This letter was reportedly written in 1871. No conclusive proof exists to show that this letter was ever written. However, the more I look at it, the more... Um, Interesting it becomes relating to world events. It's called Albert Pike and the Three World Wars. It details the three world wars. 
it details the First and Second World War exactly, exactly how, they, how it happened. That's how it's written there. No, we can't prove that it wasn't written after it. It's up to you to decide. But anyway, he talks about the Third World War here. The Third World War must be fermented by taking advantage of the differences caused by the agenteur of the Illuminati, or the Jesuits, between the political Zionists and the leaders of the Islamic world. Now, we understand Daniel 11 to be a war in the Middle East over Israel. It fits with this. The war must be conducted in such a way that Islam, the Muslim Arabic world, and political Zionism, the state of Israel, mutually destroy each other. That's what the Bible says, basically. He shall come to his end and none shall help him. Talking about Ishmael, the descendants of Ishmael. Meanwhile, the other nations, once more divided on this issue, will be constrained to fight to the point of complete physical, moral, spiritual, and economic exhaustion. Now notice, amidst all this chaos that's happening, that they're causing in the Middle East, in the Third World War, there's going to be some domestic chaos happening. We shall unleash the nihilists and the atheists. Now, I understand that to be Marxist anarchist factions like Antifa and Black Lives Matter. All these, all these are rooted in Marxism, which is connected with atheism and nihilism or anarchism. We shall unleash them. They're being, these groups are being controlled by the Jesuits. And we shall provoke a formidable social cataclysm, which in all its horror will show clearly to the nations the effect of absolute atheism, origin of savagery and of the most bloody turmoil. We're starting to see that happening in on the streets of America. They're turning into turning into a horrible cataclysm over there day by day. Now, while the issues surround it that are causing these uprisings, some, like no one can deny that racism is is you know is in the world. These people are being manipulated. We shall unleash. All these groups are controlled by agents. Dead. I will say for the people, we as black people cannot breathe in America. Tell them. The collective need of racist white America is upon the necks of black people. <laughs> Black power. I don't see no white militia. So to the boogie boys, the three percenters, and all the rest of you scared ass rednecks. In the state of Georgia, you have the right to stand your ground. So if someone points something at you, kill them. Don't shoot them, kill them. Well, everything they're doing is completely legal according to the Constitution. Um, these, these people are obviously, you know, the main ringleader of that group. I'm sure he's, you know, being, there's very powerful agencies behind him. Um, but uh, you can see the, how the, <laughs> they're using this, this, the, these, these rights as a way of re turning the country into total anarchy and rebellion, you know. Um, and this plays right into the hands of the Black Pope. Not, not saying that they have the right to destroy all the streets and stuff, but um, like they're doing. It's not legal, but, you know, the concept of, of rising up against tyranny is the ideology behind everything they're doing. It's the justification behind it all because they think that the police are, you know, being racist and all these sorts of things. But this is only serve, going to serve to expand the government power. And it's actually very volatile because these people are 
they don't know what they're doing. We, we, this article here, what they were all standing there and someone discharged their weapon and injured a few of them. So they, anything could happen. They could accidentally shoot someone and in no time you'd have the entire country involved in a civil war. So it's a very dangerous situation. And I think that might be the way it turns out. I'm not sure how it's going to turn out, but you continue reading in the Albert Pike letter in the white there, it says, after this bloody turmoil that we're starting to see the beginning of, then everywhere the citizens obliged to defend themselves against the world minority of revolutionaries will eliminate those destroyers of civilization and the multitude disillusioned with Christianity whose deistic spirits will from that moment be without compass or direction, anxious for an ideal, but without knowing where to render its adoration, will receive the true light through the universal manifestation of the pure doctrine of Lucifer brought out finally into the public view, which um, we understand to be Sunday law, and the, which is the wholesale worship of Satan when he appears as, a, as an angel of light. This manifestation will result in the general reactionary movement, which will follow the destruction of Christianity and atheism, both conquered and exterminated at the same time. So in the end, the one world religion will not be Marxist or atheist. That's a vehicle to get them there, but it's going to be a a you know a, a, a religion where there is wor worship where a being is worshipped where there are religious rites and um, doctrines enforced notice the reactionary movement the old paradigm the hegelian dialectic problem reaction solution they, they calculate how people are going to react to the problem that they create notice on the other side of the political spectrum you have conservatives and they're also ready to fight for their rights. Well, we are a 3% group. So when it comes time to stand up and defend the Constitution and the people of the United States, the 3% of groups will be the first ones up there right along with some of the bikers for Trump. They'll be right in there too. We will not let somebody take down our Constitution. I swore an oath back in 1973 to defend this country against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And if it comes to domestic, that's what I do. If the UN comes in here, there are foreign invaders in our country, and I will do what I got to do to stand up for them. And you called yourself a militia, does that mean with guns? If that's what it takes. What's going to happen is, if the thing starts here, and we have a civil war, people are going to have to pick what side they're on. We have a constitutional republic. Power comes from the people of the United States of America. And it's the voice of the people, it's the will of the people. Our position is the people need to take point. Take a good look at the face of the militia and the 3% movement. <laughs> These are patriots that are not going to have their rights infringed upon, and our way of life uh, will be preserved and maintained. So help us God. Guns up! Guns up! I don't want nobody taking my gun rights away from me. I don't want nobody taking my freedom of speech from me. You know, so I'll die for that. Hell yeah. So the 3% uh, mo movement, it's a uh, prevailing belief that uh, has root and, and foundation in the uh, Revolutionary War and the uh, belief that a small group of motivated people and Minutemen, and patriots, can defend themselves from tyranny. Yes, sir, I consider myself a Christian. I believe that uh, most of the people in George Q. DeForest's 3% would identify as Christian. Um, our laws were based on Judeo-Christian beliefs. The Bible tells us that there's a fight for good and evil right here on uh, planet Earth. And the country is divided. I mean, looking at it from 30,000 feet, this country is straight up divided. We've never been in this situation, not in my lifetime. But in the end, uh, we're not gonna yield, we're not gonna back down one iota. And uh, you know, they could take that as, anybody on the planet can take that as a threat, or uh, we'll say it's a promise. Warning, warning, this is a secured area. Go back to where you came from. <laughs> So you can see both sides of the political spectrum 
are um, ready to go to war for what they believe are their rights. And, um, you know, this whole, it all comes back to, like he said there, that it comes back to the Revolutionary War, Declaration of Independence, which goes back to Bellamy. The people on the, on the left side are obviously feeling their rights are being infringed, etc. Like, it, um, but just want to repeat that it, all this plays into the hands of the black papacy. You know, he said that it's a promise. These are also promises. He that kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Whosoever slayeth Cain or challenge the powers that be, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. These are promises from God. Many of these people, I believe, are sincere, but their, their ideology is, is just out of line with, it's very out of line with the Bible. And um, he noticed he talked about a civil war, the, the guy in the beginning. He said people are going to have to pick what side they're on. Check out this graphic by Marvel Comments. Captain America Civil War, whose side are you on? This is obviously some predictive programming from 2016. Even the colors line up with the political party's colors. They're moving everyone towards this. They're inciting their agents. What does it say that in Albert Pike said? Fermenting, um, we shall unleash. All these, both of these sides are being manipulated. Both of them. The liberals are being manipulated through this race, racism and social justice narrative from the mainstream media, but the conservatives are being, being um, agitated by the removal of civil liberties through COVID and, and people t putting their hands on the Second Amendment. And uh, America is actually starting to look like a little, little bit like that graphic there now. As much as they might think they're going to, they're going to um, create a better government or create a better society, Bob Prophecy doesn't say that that's going to happen. We read in Revelation 13, it says, And he, talking about the U.S. government, exerciseth all the power of the first beast, which is growing before him, and causeth all the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So in spite of all their efforts, the U U.S. government is going to become the most tyrannical regime that the world has ever seen. He doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men. So amidst all this civil war, all this anarchy, there's going to be, there's going to be amidst World War III with Turkey and Israel being destroyed, uh, Islam being, you know, the king of the north coming to his end, there's going to be fire from heaven, civil war. All this shock and awe tactic is just going to, men's hearts are going to be failing them for fear. All these things are going to happen at once. And he deceiveth them which dwell on the earth by the means of the, those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. So all of this rebellion is actually going to bring us towards these things. You know, this, as the Spirit of God is being removed, we're just seeing more and more chaos throughout the world. So it's actually the people's wickedness that is bringing all this on. Amidst all of this carnage, and wasting in death, the man of peace, the so-called man of peace is going to stand up. He's going to stand up for our rights. As Pope Francis said, the right to life is first among human rights. He's going to stand up to be there to mediate. The papacy will criticize tyrannical governments, but not because they want to benefit the people, but because they want to, they want to make, bring back the control they had during the Middle Ages that we talked about last time. They want to be the mediator of, over, over the governments of men, to enforce their religious laws upon all men. As Voltaire said, the interest of the human race requires a check to restrain sovereigns and protect the lives of the people. This check of religion might, in a general convention, be placed in the hands of the popes. That's what's going to happen. The pope's going to step in to, to help everyone out after from all the chaos that they've created through all their ideologies and and all their agents that are causing all of this, this chaos. Who is the Pope and the papacy going to blame for all of this that's happening? Who are they going to blame? They're going to blame God's people. When nation is rising against nation, as Jesus talked about in Matthew 24, and all this civil war and, and everything's happening, then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. 
During this time, God's people are going to be blamed for everything that's happening. God's people have always been blamed for the chaos that's happening. Remember when, when Rome was burnt down, Nero blamed, blamed, blamed Paul. The Jews were blaming Paul during his trial before the Romans. Ananias, the high priest, said, For we have found this man a pestilent fellow and a mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world, a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarene. Now, was Paul a mover of sedition? No, absolutely not. He taught in Romans 13 that we should obey the government and in many places. He was, a, he was an upstanding citizen. He had a perfect record. So if we, as God's people, have been involved in any, any sort of sedition or any violence against others, they will, they will have a, a right case against us when we're brought before the case, before the courts. But the best witness we can give is if we, if we have, you know, been obedient citizens to the government. The, remember, the Inquisition's after us. That Jesus said, Jesus said about about the devil, the prince of this world come if he had nothing on me. We will not be able to have the same, um, the same record to to give, you know, Christian experience anyway. Remember, they 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 detailed the scriptural errors of the Branch Davidians as a justification for their murder of them all. But take heed to yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to councils, and in the synagogues ye shall be beaten, and ye shall be brought before rules and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them. Where to be able to prove all of our actions and beliefs from the Bible? We don't want them to be able to prove, prove that our actions and beliefs are wrong, according to the Bible. We've got to, we've, we're out, we've got to give a testimony against them, not them against us. That's why we need to um, be obedient to, to rules, according to all the things that don't um, contradict our, our, our conscientious beliefs in the, according to the Bible. And just as some practical illustrations here, this is from Ellen White when she was in Australia. She says, Our brethren Firth from Kellyville, who were arraigned for breaking the Sunday law, were today sentenced by the court either to pay a fine of five shillings or to be placed in the stocks. They brought an old law made in Charles II's time to bear upon this case of Sunday breaking. Our brethren refused to pay the fine and therefore will be put in the stocks. But as the people have been well behaved in New South Wales, these instruments of torture have fallen to disuse and there is no such instruments as stocks in the command of the prosecutors. The stocks will have to be made for the occasion and punish the heinous crime of working on the first day of the week. These brethren obviously had broken the Sunday laws that were put in that time now i'm not criticizing them for what they did but when the sunday law comes we don't have to make an active choice to to not obey it and work or other laws that we might not agree with that they're making for us now we're told here in another letter ellen white says what shall we do says one when the sunday law is passed why said i devote the day to god take your students and go right into the bush as they call it Go right into the woods and from house to house carry your Bible and there teach them the way of life. Apostle Paul says, If it be possible, as much as life in you, live peaceably with all men. We're to go to the greatest lengths we can to obey and conform ourselves so as not to upset the authorities and upset other people. You know, obviously we're, we're to not to compromise our faith or, you know, be manipulated in any way but we're to try and our best to 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 um give the best witness to others so we're not disturbed of the peace because that's what they're going to that's what they're going to charge us with that's what they're going to that's what paul and all the apostles were charged with for the government governors recompense no man evil for evil verse 19 avenge not yourselves give place to wrath for it is written vengeance is mine Overcome evil with good, etc. But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, is not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. See, we're obedient, we're, we're obedient to all these commands. But by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. So we're to comm be commended in every man's conscience, not to do things that are, that are taken wrong, you know, or, or are outright wrong. We read about Cain and Abel. Here were the representatives of the two great classes. Abel, as priest, offered in solemn faith his sacrifice. Cain was willing 
to offer the fruit of his ground, but refused to connect with his offering the blood of peace. His heart refused to show his repentance of sin and his faith in a saviour by offering the blood of beasts. He refused to acknowledge his need of a redeemer. This to his proud heart was dependence and humiliation. Is dependence and humiliation something that should be, you know, avoided by us? Of course not. We are dependent. We are, you know, like we, we should be have humility towards God and, and, and dependent upon Him, you know, for our protection. So really, you know, this this whole study that I've that I've learnt as I put it together, what it what it has helped me understand, you know, is really it's really a lesson of obedience. You know, of obedience to children to their parents, of wives to their husbands. I think as a people, as God's people, we we, we very much lack all these things. And as to the ordained authorities that God has set us, even in the world, you know, we cherish rebellion in our hearts. Rebellion is in our heart. It's a natural tendency. All these all these Bellaminium ideology is just it's natural, you know, it's it's it appeals to the to the to the heart, the, the fallen nature, you know. But we have a lot to learn as far as obedience goes to, to, to get back, to get to that state of, of apostolic Christianity and even, even beyond that is going to be required of the last day people. That is going to be, you know, like a, 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 when people see you, they're going to see, you know, you're going to commend yourself to every man's conscience. A harmless person that people, Christian people that we have to be. That doesn't mean that we're weak. Doesn't mean obeying the authorities makes you weak or or somehow, you know, cowardly. You know, William Tyndale, for example, in his book *The Obedience of a Christian Man*, he taught that we have to obey even tyrannical rulers. But at the same time, he was disobeying a commandment of the king by smuggling his books into England because, you know, we have to obey God rather than men when it comes to matters of conscience he was he's been dubbed god's outlaw yet he talked taught abject obedience or t- complete obedience to god's ordinations or god's ordinances you know i just feel that uh, it's a lesson of of humility and a call to obedience that i think we need to learn anyway i invite you to kneel with me as we close with prayer heavenly father we thank you for the the day we thank you for your your word. We thank you for the examples throughout history that have been shown us, and and um, we thank you that we don't need to question regarding our duties as Christian soldiers. We just pray that you give us the strength, give us the humility, and the courage to go forward as as we do. We don't know what's uh, going to happen in this world, how things are panning out, and it looks very grim, and we are, even our own safety is, is going to be at stake. But we just pray you. Um, protect us as we as we give our lives into your hands and trust in you and we just ask you help us to be those that people that commend ourselves in, in, the, in, in the sight of every man's conscience please give us an obedient and um, humble hearts we pray and we thank you in jesus name amen